Oh, hi everybody, this is Mark Taylor Canfield, and I just did a, a show with George Blaze from WCIU TV in Chicago and got to play a little bit of my electric guitar there, so I thought I would throw it in at the beginning of this. But um, I just wanted to give a quick digest of what's been going on in the Seattle area. Um, some cool things, actually, my friends uh, in the Black Tones, they're touring the West Coast. Uh, Eva and Cedric Walker. And Pearl Jam guitarist Mike McCready has been wearing their t-shirt on stage. At least he did down in LA during that band's uh, international tour, which they're on right now. Um, so yeah, the Black Tones get a lot of creds and support from the elders in the music scene here in Seattle, and that's so good to see. Um, this was big. Um, the BBC World Service came to Seattle and they hosted the Arts Hour broadcast here. Uh, they told us that the potential audience for that broadcast was 279 million people because it's heard all around the globe. They chose uh, KEXP DJ and Black Tones vocalist and guitarist Eva Walker to curate the show. And instead of bringing in, you know, the opera company and the symphony, like they would probably have expected. She brought in a bunch of cutting edge and underground artists, uh, including our buddy Marshall Hugh from the Martial Law Band. They performed during the event at the Rainier Arts Center. Um, so thanks to Nikki and the gang for coming to Seattle and hosting that and giving us a platform. By the way, Marshall is quite an activist, so the audience heard a lot about uh, the economic dislocation of artists in the city. Um, caused by a lot of the corporate uh, headquarters billion dollar developments here and the high cost of real estate and high rents so um, but he was great on stage during the show he kind of got people going uh, the musicians and artists um, a lot of them talked about in the audience and on the stage talked a lot about the cultural effects of mass corporate gentrification and I don't think the BBC was expecting that and I got a chance on that program to talk about the great eclectic uh, art and music scene here in Seattle and all the very talented bands. Um, so I gave a shout out to a bunch of p different bands from Seattle that I think people should listen to, including the Black Tones and the Marshall Law Band and Shana Shepard for sure. Um, so it was a great opportunity to kind of talk to the world about this amazing talent in our city. And the Folklife Festival is back, Seattle's biggest and most popular free festival. Um, and so it's happening over Memorial Day weekend. For many years now, blues, funk, rock, and other kinds of music have been included in the festival as folk music, which at first I thought was a little strange, and it kind of brings to mind, you know, like Dolly Parton's initial uh, refusal uh, or decline, declination, decline, declining her acceptance into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by saying that she wasn't rock, um, but that she didn't do rock and roll. But um, after a while, I kind of got used to the idea that these are traditional forms of American music, so why not? Why shouldn't they be at a folk festival? And but as well as you know, blues and funk and rock bands and other things. There's there's also of course. Uh, a highlight on traditional music and dancers from all over the planet that show up there. There's a film festival and an art show. Um, it's a big arts and cultural festival and it's all free which is amazing. It's all uh, funded by uh, some sponsors and a foundation so and it is you know Seattle's largest and only free art music and cultural festival I think happening and it, this is after like a two-year hiatus, so uh, I didn't apply to perform this year because I didn't even know that was going to happen. I, you know, I missed that memo, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to go go on. And I've had a bunch of other things I'm doing with my music, um, a lot of writing and recording, actually. So, by the way, I have the inside story on what was happening with the Folklife Festival before the pandemic and the economic downturn, and. Uh, I wrote an editorial in the Capitol Hill Times uh, because at that time I was a staff writer for them addressing whether the festival would survive as a free event or whether they would start charging at the door and the folk like staff at that time were giving some pretty strong indications that uh, they might either cancel the festival or start charging if people didn't start donating more 
so uh, you know my article was a little bit controversial apparently because the executive director for the folk life uh, festival organization uh, immediately demanded uh, to be able to a rebuttal in the in the paper he wanted to be able to write his own editorial re refuting what I had said um, and I had written that if someone gave me three million dollars and I didn't really have to pay most of the performers because most of the artists I think perform without payment um, travel expenses but but I am sure that I could put on a free festival if I was given three million dollars and didn't have to pay a lot of the artists in other words where was all that money going but anyway the executive director for the festival demanded to be given a chance to respond to my article and in that article he claimed that the festival would continue as a free event despite the complaints that we had heard about lack of funding so I guess I had called this guy out and he was forced to respond bottom line that's what journalism should do right is hold people accountable uh, because before that editorial uh, they were floating this trial balloon about either charging a fee at, uh, for the for entrance or just canceling the event altogether and after my editorial uh, they stopped doing that. That trial balloon got deflated, <laughs> went away. So, also locally in Seattle politics, here's a quick report on that. Locally, our new mayor, Bruce Harrell, has eliminated a lot of the houseless encampments in the city, what I, which I call economic refugee camps. Um, and at first he was doing that without offering any plan to house people, which was a little bit disturbing. A lot disturbing, actually. Um, I've known Bruce for years, and he's usually... Uh, in the past was considered a liberal democrat but he did receive some money from at least one billionaire who also gave a lot of money to trump um during um harold's campaign he got money from the same person so he also you know definitely as soon as he got into office he seems to favor business interests and he's all about law and order and cleaning up the city and getting rid of the house houseless encampments so not the most um empathetic approach um understatement of the year uh, so that has caused some dissent from some of the more progressive members of the city council, like our internationally recognized city council member and democratic socialist, Shama Sawan. Um, so we have a adversarial relationship in Seattle between the mayor and the city council. In some cities, the mayor is actually a member of the city council. He's like the president of the council. But here, there are two separate uh, bodies and can both propose legislation and, and both block each other at times so there's some tension there uh, the, the city council traditionally is very progressive the mayor a little bit more on the side of business and neoliberalism so uh, no surprise there right um, there are two members of the city council who have been causing a ruckus lately they refused to vote in favor of Shama Sawant's uh, resolution supporting the right of Starbucks workers to organize unions so uh, they said they didn't want to send the wrong message by voting no, but they didn't think that this, it was the city council's job to speak out about, you know, private interests and private things. So, whatever. Anyway, uh, Andrew Lewis is my city council member, and he's he was Robert Reich, uh, the former U.S. Secretary of Labor under Clinton. He was Robert Reich's uh, student at Berkeley, I believe, so, um, in college. So, Robert Reich came to his campaign event at the Labor Temple in Seattle, and I got to hang out with Robert Reich. Very intelligent guy, by the way. Um, okay, another story here. The Seattle Times did an investigative report and found that major lawsuits paid out by Washington State Police Departments have increased by over 300% um, since the period between 2017 and 2019. Uh, so the Seattle Police Department recently paid out a $3 million settlement in the wrongful death suit uh, after Seattle police killed Charlene Lyles in her own home, a pregnant woman of, with four children there. Oh my God, it was such a terrible tragedy and horrible thing that they did. But Anyway, um, incidents of excessive use of force by Seattle Police Department has diminished since the Black Lives Matter protests when there were 19,000 complaints filed against the police department for various kinds of misconduct um, but when it does happen and there is uh, when there is excessive use of force the Seattle Times says that it the stats show that um, black men and native P 
people are most often the target. So not much has changed there, right? Um, the Seattle Police Department was under an investigation by the Department of Justice for the excessive use of force and racial profiling. They've been working under a consent degree, decree since and um, are supposedly being forced to clean up their act. Uh, apparently not completely. Anyway, uh, we just lost a great musician here, Alan White, the former drummer for John Lennon on the Imagine track and the drummer for the Plastic Ono Band. Uh, he was also a member of the Super Prog Group, yes. Um, he lived in Seattle and would sometimes perform in local clubs with other people and yeah, so great loss. Um, where is that Plastic Ono Band drum set that he had because it disappeared and I'm not sure they've recovered it. Also, man, one of the weirdest things I ever saw was uh, the Plastic Ono Band on TV. Uh, it was a TV show that I saw uh, archived at YouTube, and they it was like the Mike Douglas show or something like that. Is that is he any related? To, anyway, is he related to the other actor named Douglas? Anyway, um, uh, so during that show. The Plastic Ono Band performed with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and when the curtains opened, you saw these people standing there with their instruments and wearing masks. And then, not very long into the song, all of a sudden they turned around and you realized that you had been looking at their backs with masks on the back of their heads and then holding their instruments from behind. So it was just this really, really weird, surrealistic kind of take. And when I saw that, uh, I saw it on YouTube when I was a kid, and it just blew my mind. I was like, what the... What is that? Or no, not on YouTube. I was, where did I see it? Some old uh, cable show or something that had, like, old old Nickelodeon or something like that that's, that featured older programs. Anyway, it blew my mind. I just thought, these people are crazy. Because I actually did think it was them standing there with masks on their face. And when they turned around, it did kind of like shake up my reality to some degree. And then I watched, you know, like right after that, they had a segment with Donovan. I think he may have been on the same show or something. Uh, whatever the show was, they had those weird flower decal things on the wall. And he was like uh, talking about how he was an Aquarian and uh, that he was also, I believe, I think he was talking about being a hermaphrodite, saying that he was he was androgynous or something like that, and just really crazy, weird things that only hippies would say on national TV, you know, <laughs> during that movement, because they had all been dropping, you know, well, lots of stuff, but uh, they were being very psychedelic at that time, and so uh, you never knew what was going to come out of the mouths of somebody like, you know, Jimi Hendrix or Donovan or any of those people who were tripping. Um... But anyway, let's see, is there anything else uh, I should talk about with you guys? There's, you know, I'm still doing the Just Santos show every week, so you can see, uh, you can see my um, segments with him on YouTube. All of them are are up there. And otherwise, I hope you all are doing well, despite some of the stuff in the news lately, but I would um, highly recommend that, as I said on George Blaze's show earlier today, um, I would highly recommend the healing power of music and art, especially music, um, because it can really do things to your heart and your soul that are good, very positive, and music, uh, as I was telling George, is a great gift to give the world, so if you are a musician, then thank you, and thank you for all of the great musicians along the way um, who've had you know such a big influence on me and and, and so much amazing music um, it really uh, is amazing what music can do and how much it's changed people's lives and continues to do so and just how timeless it is too it just seems like um, you don't uh, you don't ever lose music once it's out there in the world it just seems to live forever and that's a beautiful thing like I was saying to George you know I'm I was listening to Duke Ellington earlier today so what does that tell you it's a 
music uh, lasts forever um, and it is a very beautiful thing so so teach the children music and let them play rock and roll <laughs> or whatever they want to play because it's a, a very very good thing uh, to to see that you know to to see people really enjoying themselves and being sort of um, being filled with the joy of music and expression it's a wonderful thing and as I said before really quick uh, addendum to this report uh, May 3rd was World Press Freedom Day as a de designated by the United Na as <laughs> designated by the United Nations sorry sometimes I talk too fast and my tongue gets twisted but um, as executive director well now CEO for Democracy Watch News I participated in an international conference sponsored by UNESCO where we heard from media executives government officials, journalists, and NGOs about threats to press freedom around the world. And this year's theme was Journalism Under Digital Siege, and it turns out that besides an increasing number of authoritarian states cracking down on journalism, hacking has now become a major problem. Also, seven reporters have been killed in, the, in Ukraine, 27 reporters and media workers have been killed globally in 2022, and worldwide there are currently 479 media workers and journalists in prison. So not a great picture. Um, the reporter, Reporters Without Borders just released their World Press Freedom Index rankings for 2022, and the United States has ranked 42nd in the world in terms of press freedom, behind countries like Burkina Faso in Africa and Costa Rica in Central America. Um, so Costa Rica is ranked at number 8, which has a very strong tradition of protecting freedom of the press. By the way, China is ranked 175 out of, a, out of 180, and Russia is ranked like 155th. So not so great. Uh, the U.S. ranking is down in the 40s, largely due to, to corporate media monopolies. Reporters Without Borders reports, quote, many popular outlets are owned by a small handful of wealthy individuals. In a diverse global media landscape, local news has declined significantly, significantly in recent years. They also say that disinformation affecting American society has created an atmosphere where citizens no longer know who to trust. Online harassment, particularly towards women and minorities, is also a serious issue on the rise for journalists and can impact their quality of life and safety. Um, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden are at the top of the rankings. Uh, but we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do here in the United States. And as CEO now for a nonprofit news organization, I can tell you that there are some uh, new nonprofits that might bring, there might be some hope on the horizon. And, um, although this story is completely censored by corporate news, you're never going to hear these rankings um, on CNN or MSNBC. So, you know, you're hearing it here first, folks, or only here, um, some of you. Um, it's a highly censored news story. Like, the corporate media does not want you to know that we're ranked 42nd in the world in terms of press freedom. It just makes them look bad and they don't want to admit it. Um, because they're large, they're part of the reason, well, because they're corporate media monopolies is only a handful of people own most of the media in the United States that's the problem very hierarchical system um, but you know it's up to all editors and reporters and publishers and producers and media makers all over the world all day long every day <laughs> to keep in mind that press freedom is the number one um, priority and for a journalist and to make sure that uh, that and human rights probably the you know always keep that at the top of your your list of things to address um, and try to push the story because you know as I said corporate media isn't going to report it so share this video with your friends and let them know what I'm saying here um, and check out the MTC report whenever you can subscribe to my channel and click the bell button and all that stuff you hear on all these videos you know if you click the bell button you get a notification when I put up a new video which is about once a week right now sometimes more um, but to get back to what I was saying the new nonprofits uh, like the like the nonprofit documented in New York City is a one great example of a nonprofit news organization and they specifically focus on reporting on news that affects immigration and immigrants so that must that might be you know one of our best hopes for the future um, if we can it might really be able to make a difference in the media landscape, these nonprofits, um, if we can get the grant funding and other kinds of funding and public support that they deserve. That's the main problem, is they're starved for money. Um, a lot of people in nonprofits uh, and news organizations like that don't make any money. They're just doing it because they love 
what they do, even though they're working really hard. Um, the Immigration News Service documented is a great example of what I'm talking about, but there are many um, other news organizations that are nonprofit that have popped up over the last year or so, a lot of them focusing on news affecting indigenous people and other unrepresented, unrepresented populations. So that's really important that that's happening and it needs to you know, happen more. There's so many stories that aren't being told and people who aren't being heard. And of course that's going to happen when you have a, a news media owned by corporations who, whose only interest is really selling you advertising or selling advertising and the advertiser's goal is you know, to get you to buy something in between the news reports. So just remember that's how they make their money. Um, this is Mark Taylor Canfield for the MPC Report. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you enjoy the video. Please share it with your friends and family. Subscribe to my channel. Like the video and all that. Try to support independent media. It's really important. It's more important these days than ever. So thanks for checking out uh, the video. Check out my music videos at YouTube. There's also lots of free uh, movies on my playlist and like over 600 ad-free videos, on, original videos on my YouTube channel. So, um, you know, it really helped me to build an audience, you know. I'm not uh, ashamed to say that. We all know that when we're doing YouTube videos that the more people who watch, the more support we're going to get. Um, I'm not doing this to make money right now or anything. I haven't, you know, uh, monetized at this point. At, at the time of this video, I haven't monetized it or in any way. I'm just trying to get the word out about what I think is important and people should know. And uh, please remember the healing power of music and check out my video, Mother Freedom, about uh, it's dedicated to people fighting for freedom and justice all over the world. You can find that on YouTube as well. It's called Mother Freedom by Mark Taylor Canfield, and it's a rockin' song. So it's also got some cool video footage of from protests from all over the world, from Belarus and Hong Kong and Nigeria and the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and all over the world. So uh, peace out, and uh, thanks for tuning in for checking in and uh, checking out what I'm doing today.